The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics Believe. I'm your host, Thomas Nagley, and with me tonight is Father William Jenkins from the Society of St. Pius V. He's also the pastor of Immaculate Conception Church in Norwood, Ohio. Hello, Father. How are you? Very fine, Tom. How about yourself? Good, Father. Thank you for being here tonight. Well, you're welcome, and thank you. Yeah. Tonight, thank God we can both be here. Yeah, definitely. Tonight, Father Jenkins and I will begin a discussion of a very pertinent little book titled Liberalism is a Sin. It was originally published in 1886 by a Spanish priest, Father Felix Sarda y Slovani. And the book caused quite a bit of a stir at its original publication, but is perhaps even more applicable to our own days. Father Silvani was uh, a bit of a prophet in um, his treatment of the liberal error. And Father Jenkins, I would like to work through this book, uh, kind of pick through it chapter by chapter and just comment upon some of the more striking quotes uh, from Father Silvani here. And just to begin with, he, uh, in the first chapter of his book, he asked, what begets liberalism? And his answer is Protestantism. Just a quick quote here. He says, Protestantism with its sliding scale of creeds is simply an inclined plane into the abyss of positive unbelief. He also says, Protestantism naturally begets toleration of error rejecting the principle of authority and religion. It has neither criterion nor definition of faith. On the principle that every individual or sect may interpret the deposit of revelation according to the dictates of private judgment, it gives birth to endless differences and contradictions. So, Father Jenkins, how would you, uh, how would you classify that, that statement? Would you say that that is true, that this idea of liberalism springs from Protestantism? Yes, I guess I would say that Protestantism itself springs from liberalism, though. It's a chicken and the egg sort of thing, you know. Okay. <clears throat> I think Martin Luther and his fellow uh, heretics, uh, who, who were his um, uh, contemporaries, and also some predecessors, such as um, the Lollards with uh, Zwingli and, um, and uh, in... Um, in uh, Geneva, right? The Lollards in England, right? And the Hussites in the Bohemia, even the century before. Uh, I think they all basically had the same liberalistic idea, which is the idea of um, the rejection of divine authority here on earth. The idea that uh, all we have to guide us is the sacred scriptures that the concept of church, that is the Catholic concept of church, with authority given by God, by Christ himself, to his apostles, and still every bit as real and as active in the church as it was when our Lord first gave the apostles the command to go and to preach, to govern, and to sanctify mankind. And that idea was rejected, in, is rejected by liberalism. And Protestantism was the first ma a first manifestation of this liberalism, uh, such that it had real traction, that people really bought into it. So, uh, but that's essentially what liberalism is. I mean, it is a rejection of the divine authority, uh, insofar as it uh, applies to a person's life here on earth. And uh, that is really uh, the Protestant idea too. The idea that we have a church with authority from God that can speak for God. Uh, remember, the, the fundamental principles of, modern, of, uh, of Protestantism had to do with uh, faith alone, scripture alone, and grace alone. Grace alone being the first of their principles. And, you know, uh, the, the, that, that can be understood and interpreted in a, Catholic, in a Catholic way. Unfortunately, the Protestants interpret it in a very non-Catholic way, in a very false way. Uh, scripture alone, uh, faith alone, cannot be interpreted in a Catholic sense at all. Even though Francis in the Vatican has said that he agrees with Martin Luther, and that the church that he, Francis, governs actually is one with Luther in their concept of redemption and salvation. 
Um, so, I mean, he's publicly apostatized from the Catholic faith, for instance, insofar as he's adopted Luther's, explicitly adopted Luther's false idea of the redemption and, and, uh, and salvation, what is necessary for salvation. But the idea, uh, then, of Scripture alone is totally repugnant to the Catholic faith because that is where you get this, this message of Protestantism. There is no authority on earth that can tell me what to do except Scripture. And nobody can really tell me what Scripture means except my own conscience and uh, the Spirit, or the, the Holy Ghost, if they want to continue to call him such. But everybody is an autonomous uh, you make faith alone and scripture alone, and then you say that the only authority that can tell you what scripture means is what you think, what I, what I think at the moment it actually means. Well, you've just rejected all, all divine authority uh, here on earth that can tell you what is true, what is false, what is right, and what is wrong. In the context of, uh, of, the, of the faith and, um, you know, in the, in the eyes of God, this major leap forward for the liberalistic program, which would uh, actually uh, divide church and state, set them at odds with each other, <clears throat> that would uh, basically free the state to be its own god, <clears throat> that would free the individual to make up his own commandments for himself, observing only what commandments that he saw necessary, and then finding out that he doesn't have to observe any of the commandments to be saved, as long as he believes. I mean, it's, it's quintessential liberalism. Protestantism, at its very root, is liberalism. <clears throat> Dr. Salvani, uh, Salvani, by the way, Dr. Sarda I. Salvani, uh, was born in 1844 in Catalan, Catalonia. And he saw things coming over his own country, uh, kind of the, the aftermath of what had been happening in France. Um, and um, he realized that there was a, a liberalistic tendency, not only in the laity, and among the more atheistic members of the Spanish government, but even in the Spanish church. And he decided he had to, he had to fight that, he had to resist that. And he published for 40 years, um, you know, for Catholic, Catholic press, a Catholic pub publication, uh, trying to educate the Catholic people in Spain about what was happening. Um, he uh, put out a number of pamphlets and books. Uh, his most famous work is the book you're holding right now, Liberalismo Espicado. And um, was translated into English by Palin. I think that is probably Palin's translation there. Mm -hmm. Right. Condé Palin? Yep. Is that right? That's right. And uh, it's a good translation. I don't know if the translation uh, conveys all of the information, all of the thought of Father uh, Felix Sari Silvani. I don't know. But it certainly captures the essence of his thought. <laughs> Remember, uh, Father Salvani, his father Sardi Salvani, saw the run-up to World War I. <clears throat> so he saw the continuous development uh, from the time he was, he, he was a young boy in 1850, right on through to the latter half of that century, and the beginning years of the 1900s, right up to World War I. So he saw liberalism in the in the, the egg, but he saw it in its fruits as well, <clears throat> and it was horrific. He died halfway through World War World War One. So he knew liberalism up close and personal. In fact, he had to fight it. Fight it. There was a kind of revolution in France to to basically disown the Catholic Church and set the 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 government of Spain free, the revolution in Spain, I should say, uh, to set the Spanish, Spanish government free from faith, disenfranchise the Catholic Church. And this led to a, ultimately a military dictatorship, which then ultimately was turned over to the Bourbons again, a restoration of the Bourbon monarchy in Spain, and then the restoration of the church again. But the transition from this uh, Catholic Spain 
to suddenly non-Catholic Spain and then anti-Catholic Spain in terms of government. And then, uh, you know, through the, through the uh, military government and the restoration of the Bourbons and then the restoration of the church's rights, it weakened the Catholic spirit of the people. And it also brought in uh, liberal bishops. And uh, the liberal clergy would oppose Father Sardi Salvani for the rest of his life. So that whatever he wrote, he actually went so far as to say that a liberal can't be a Catholic. It's impossible to mix liberalism with Catholicism. As St. Pius X would, uh, would say, he actually, St. Pius X later on in 1907 would not say that it's impossible for a man to <clears throat> actually hold modernist principles and still be a Catholic. Mm -hmm. uh, he did say it's impossible for a Catholic to be a socialist, to hold socialist principles. And so Pope Pius X indicated that it's possible for a modernist to be modernist by degrees, <clears throat> because even though he might hold mo some modernist principles, he might not yet have seen the ultimate ramifications of where that leads, the destruction of all faith. But it's impossible for a liberal not to see how this must necessarily lead to the complete disenfranchisement, not only of the church, but of God in the life of the individual person, <coughs> and ultimately of the state itself. So now there is no God over the state. So the state is its own God. And um, the citizen is basically the creature of the state, existing by the will of the state, for the, for the pleasure of the state, for the service of the state, and that's all. Mm -hmm. And that is wherever we've seen the principles of liberalism applied, that's exactly what happens. Father, I've heard it said that uh, the principle of liberalism actually came to be in the Garden of Eden. This was the mm. temptation of the serpent that man can be divorced from, from God. He can be free of God's authority. He can be a God unto himself. Well, isn't that what the Luc that's that what Lucifer told you? Right. And that's, and that's perfect liberalism. That was the first and temptation? The entire history of mankind ever since that point has been one gradual disintegration mm -hmm. and uh, just uh, descending into this terrible disease of liberalism. And Father uh, Savani here, he, he uh, in the separate, second chapter, what is liberalism? He he attempts to give a definition of it and outline some of its principles and um, just, you know, Father, that idea of, of the world gradually disintegrating into, descending into liberalism in these, these four principles that he lays out here. Tell me this does not perfectly describe our society today. Do you says, really want me to say uh, that? <laughs> he says, uh, number one, the absolute sovereignty of the individual and his entire independence of God and God's authority. Number two, the absolute sovereignty of society and its entire independence of everything which does not proceed from itself. Number three, absolute civil sovereignty and the implied right of the people to make their own laws and entire independence and utter disregard of any other criterion than the popular will expressed at the polls and in parliamentary majorities. And number four, absolute freedom of thought in politics, morals, or in religion, the unrestrained liberty of the press. Does that not perfectly describe our own society? It, it, it certainly does well describe our own society today. It describes the mentality that is given to our young people in the, in the colleges, right? Mm -hmm. It describes what is happening in the halls of Congress and in the halls of the courts, right? Now, people might be a little bit confused because they might say, well, you know, we hear a lot about God from our leaders, our politicians, not so much in the colleges, okay? But our, our politicians still talk about God and devote to God very often, don't they? Uh, well, Protestants do too, even though their, their whole religious idea is built on the principles of liberalism, they still invoke the name of God, which gives them kind of a, a veneer of being faithful. But remember, one of the prin fundamental principles of Protestantism is you don't have to obey the commandments to be saved. You just have to believe, right? So to invoke the name of God is fine, as long as you realize it's just a matter of paying lip service to God. We invoke God's name, just kind of, you know, wave at, at God, in the, in the, in, almost in the same sense in the English kind of wave at the queen, as if she really had a, a role in government over there. Um, but, I mean, it's purely honorary, honestly. I mean, you know, I can't imagine anyone actually contradicting that in good, in good conscience. It's purely honorary, um, but that's all. And beyond that, uh, they do what they do as they please. Um, and that's essentially what liberalism 
our own liberalism does. Now, ultimately, it will lead to a rejection of the very idea of God. Um, at, at root in a modernism is this very chaos of liberalism. Modernism is a kind of a species of liberalism. And uh, it's kind of a, 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 a pious, it's liberalism with a pious veneer. So whenever you hear somebody advocating for uh, something evil using God's name, you have the ultimate result of this, this, this pious, blasphemous liberalism. For example, recently some of the uh, Planned Parenthood uh, pro-death people were, were using the expression that had it blazoned all over their demonstration, thank God for abortion, right? Well, if their God is the devil, yes, they can, that definitely, they, can, they, they have him to thank for it, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Satan certainly has taken credit for it, and there are many honest abortionists who actually do openly worship Satan and actually attribute uh, abortion to the rise and prevalence of satanic power, okay? So this whole idea of thanking God for abortion is one of the worst blasphemies possible, right? But that's, again, liberalism is all about that. In a sense saying, uh, we can do this and we can push this, this in God's face and show that we do not have to uh, honor him in any way or obey him in any way. <coughs> and um, when you read that description of what a society looks like that has been taken over by liberalism, yes, it, it describes it very well. The ultimate and complete rejection of any practical influence of God or obligation to God in private and in public life. And Father, you mentioned this connection between liberalism and modernism. In the title chapter of the book, Liberalism is a Sin, he, uh, he, he describes here uh, how, how liberalism offends faith, and this sounds very, very similar to, to modernism. He says here, liberalism, whether in the doctrinal or practical order, is a sin. In the doctrinal order, it is heresy and consequently a mortal sin against faith. In the practical order, it is a sin against the commandments of God and of the church, for it virtually transgresses all commandments. To be more precise, in the doctrinal order, liberalism strikes at the very foundations of faith. It is heresy, radical, and universal, because within it are comprehended all heresies. In the practical order, it is a radical and universal infraction of the divine law, since it sanctions and authorizes all infractions of that law. Sounds very similar to modernism, but... Yes, and uh, also, Tom, again, getting back to Protestantism, where you started. I mean, if there, if there is anything that that sanctions the violation of all the laws of God. It is a belief that says we, we all we have to do is believe in God and believe in the redemption and then that we can do as we please. And there are no adverse consequences to this, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the complete di divorce, the complete separation of what one claims to believe on the one hand and what one does on the other, it is a kind of spiritual schizophrenia that attacks a person, it really, and it, it, it goes right to the root of human nature and, 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 and vilifies it and it, it, it vitiates it, I should say. It, um, um, it makes of every man a complete hypocrite. Mm -hmm. Yes, I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Yes, I believe he died in my, for my sins. And yes, I believe I'm a sinner. But I, I'm such a sinner that I can't do what is right. I have to sin. I have no choice. And so, as firmly as I believe, the, to that extent do I sin. And the more firmly I believe, the more, the more outrageously I sin. Um, but one could not find a more egregious contradiction. But this is at the very heart of Protestantism, if Protestantism has a heart. Father, the, the text agrees with that idea perfectly. Just a, a few quick quotes here. He says, It knows no dogma except the dogma of self-assertion. Hence it is heresy, fundamental and radical, the rebellion of the human intellect against God. also says, It is therefore the radical and universal denial of all divine truth and Christian dogma, the primal type of all heresy, and the supreme rebellion against the authority of God and his church. As with Lucifer, its maxim is, I will not serve. 
And this one, Father, says, liberalism in the order of action is license, recognizing no principle or rule beyond itself. So that idea of, sure. if you believe, do whatever you want, say yeah. boldly. Well, I mean, look at the, the fundamental moral principle, so-called, of Satanism. And the fundamental, some moral principle, so-called, of Wicca, witchcraft, they're the same principle. And thou harmest none, do as thou wilt. If, as long as you don't hurt anyone, do what you want. So the only restraint is whether you're hurting another person. Otherwise, you do as you please. God has nothing to do with it, right? And so, uh, I mean, what a blasphemy is this, right? right? And this is not out of love for the other person, that you just don't hurt another person, right? And basically, the, the principle is just a matter of saying, okay, we're individual gods and respect each other to that extent, okay? But the fact is, I mean, you know that even though they say this, right, as long as you don't hurt anyone, do what you want to do. The fact is we know. Human nature being what it is, as long as you don't hurt anyone, we know how long that lasts and how firm that is, right? Uh, it is human nature and it is human history that we devour each other like wolves, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what happens. That's what you'll find in Satanism. And that's what you're going to have in, uh, in Wicca, right? Um, even though they talk about white witchcraft and, and I, you know, the, the good witches and all that, I mean, this is all big talk these days about the good witches and the bad witches and all that. It's all evil. It's all from, even though witches claim they don't believe in Satan, they're being, they're, they're actually being very foolish, to say the least, because Satan is manipulating them like pieces on a chessboard. And he's playing them because witchcraft is all about power. It's all about demanding power. I want power over others. I want power over things. I want power over nature. In other words, I want to be, have the powers of a god. Yeah. I want to be a god. I want to be a goddess myself, right? And Satan is more than willing to play that game with every witch, okay, who, who is willing to, to uh, roll the dice, right, with his soul. And, and uh, surrender his soul to that. And of course, the Satanists go much, they, they go even beyond that. They explicitly acknowledge the power of Satan to give them power. But little do they know that, uh, well, maybe eventually they do find out that Satan does not give generously. Our Lord, our Lord says, peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives do I give, okay? And we see our Lord on the cross then, how he gives. Right? We see how God gives. Right? Satan does not do that. He, if he, whatever, he, whatever he gives, he gives for the sake of getting control over us. So even though he gives the illusion of power, he'll give the illusion of power over other people, he'll give the illusion of power over other things, but he's, meantime, that's his manner of taking control of the person, the individual, the soul itself. And, um, you know, liberalism in freeing the, the, the individual from the commandments of God, the dictates of God, liberalism in freeing the individual from the commands of the church established by Christ, and to whom our Lord gave his own authority. Liberalism in freeing the state at every level, including the supreme authority of the, of the national and ultimately world government is playing right into the hands of Satan. It's maneuvering the entire human race into the hands where they talk about freedom, 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 liberal, liberality and liberalism and all the rest. And what they're doing is they're progressively enslaving themselves to one who does not love them, one who hates them and wants to devour them. Um, what you've said, I mean, uh, the words of Dr. Uh, Father Sardi Salvati are so to the point. Even in translation, they're right to the point. I'd have to recommend that, that all of our listeners get a copy of this book and, and read, read it through. Mm -hmm. Because it would help them to understand not only what is happening in our own country today, but help them understand what is happening in the whole world today. It'll even help them understand what is happening in the church today. And uh, not only that, but it will help them understand it in a way that they cannot understand it now. There are a lot of traditional Catholics who are very liberal. They think like liberals in many ways, and they don't even realize it. Progressives, whatever you want to call them, you know, they, they have their ideas, and there are a lot of, 
even, yes, traditional Catholics who may see clearly enough to attend the traditional Mass, and maybe only the traditional Mass, and who want to be faithful, want to follow the Ten Commandments, raise their families correctly, and so on. But when it comes down to pursuing living their daily lives, they are living them as practical liberals. They don't even know it. That book could cure them of this, enable them to see what's, what's still wanting in them. Sure. The, the next uh, section of the book, Father, he talks about the gravity of this sin of liberalism that we've been discussing. And like you said, very direct to the point, he begins the chapter, liberalism is a mortal sin. Uh, so he, he says here, the gravest of all sins are those against faith. The reason is evident. Faith is the foundation of the supernatural order, and sin is sin insofar as it attacks this supernatural order at one or another point. Hence, that is the greatest sin which attacks this order at its very foundation. He also quotes St. Thomas Aquinas here when he says, The gravity of sin is determined by the interval which it places between man and God. Now sin against faith separates man from God as far as possible. Since it deprives him of the true knowledge of God, it therefore follows that sin against faith is the greatest of all sins. Right. And you notice, by the way, and again in conjunction with what uh, Father Sardin is saying here, Pope Pius X says the same thing about modernism. He says modernism is the worst enemy of the church because it lays the axe to the very root of faith, not just the faith, by denying a doctrine or two or three, but it destroys the very concept of faith. And in that sense, you might even say that modernism is the next logical step beyond liberalism. Because liberalism says, okay, you can have, all the, you can have your faith if you want. Whatever faith you want, that's fine. But it's your faith, keep it to yourself. And if you want to, practice it behind closed doors, but it has no place in the public forum and public life. And so you are not permitted to bring it up in schools and in court laws, uh, courts of law, on the streets, anywhere, outside of your door, behind your closed walls, you may not practice your faith. I mean, what could be more totalitarian? What could be more communistic than that, right? Uh, what could be more Marxist in that idea? You know, this is what liberalism says. And this is the message that has been coming in our country. Keep it to yourself. If you want to talk about a God, fine. But it's a generic God. It's pure and a generic God. It's like the cosmic gas, right? Has no character, does not know, does not love, does not have commandments that bind us all. Okay? Use, use the, the idea of God to include everything from my Allah to your blessed trinity to Teilhard de Chardin's cosmic mushroom. You know, the, the word that essentially is meaningless, but is nice and comforting, you know. Use that, but other than that, keep it all to yourself. It doesn't apply. Now, th that is like this. That is like taking an axe and severing a person's head from a spinal cord. That's what you get. You get a quadriplegia that way. When someone uh, a, a, suffers a catastrophic spinal cord injury at the base of his neck, he becomes a quadriplegic. So you separate basically the thoughts. The body cannot cannot act. Okay. But modernism goes the next step, and it says. Not only can't you act upon your faith in any way that impinges on the life of another person, because that's an intrusion on another person. So your faith has to remain entirely in your own, basically in your own head. Just keep it to yourself. Now the modernist comes along and says that now we're going to destroy even that. Now we're going to attack even that and say, your faith is nothing but your own experience, your own personal experience. And, um, you know, the modernist, again, I mean, you cannot separate the liberal and the modernist because liberalism inevitably leads to modernism. When you have a, a liberal who insists on continuing to believe in God personally, then you wind up with a modernist, okay? Who has to construct modernism in order to somehow justify the fact that he continues to believe something. Otherwise, liberalism ultimately must lead to atheism.
you know, logically it would. Right? But those who will not give up on some kind of an idea of the divine, as the modernists call it, well, they have to take the modernist route and read what St. Pius X says in 1907. Okay, Father, Dr. Tsar Isalani was still alive at that time, okay? Catholic priest, I think he had a doctorate, I don't know. Uh, that's why I refer to him as Dr. Tsar Isalani, but call him Father. He, he uh, was alive when Pope St. Pius X issued the encyclical on modernism. He was alive, he was not alive when Our Lady appeared at Fatima in 1917. Okay, as I say, he died in 1916. But uh, in the encyclical against modernism, Pope St. Pius X said that modernism believe, begins with two false philosophies. And these false philosophies play out in modernism at every turn until you get to the ultimate rules of modernism. And he says that those, 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 those fundamental philosophies, so the philosophical errors, uh, both of which I think are condemned in the syllabus of errors already, <coughs> which Father Sardi Isalvani upheld in you know, his writings. And uh, one of them is um, the, the idea of naturalism and uh, what we call rash, rationalism, right? But the other is also a, uh, a kind of agnosticism, okay? Phenomenalism and agnosticism. Uh, phenomenalism actually, uh, it kind of follows upon agnosticism. Uh, the Father the St. Pius X talks about the agnosticism of the modernist as being an idea we cannot know God, he is infinitely great, he's beyond us, we cannot know him uh, or anything about him, even, even naturally, even by reason. Okay? Now that was condemned by the First Vatican Council. It says the human reason was made by God with the ability to know there is a God and to understand, to at least know what his attributes are. Okay? That's just the power of reason. That's even without faith. Um, so that flatly contradicts the modernists. But the modernists go, go farther and they say that to overcome that agnosticism, that man cannot by reason know anything about God, even his existence. Man has a religious sense which enables him to experience the divine. And only by experience the divine, some great amazing experience of, of this divine whatever it is, that's what gives man, a man faith. It's not his intelligence, it's not truth. It's his own personal experience. So every man has his own unique and idiomatic, idiosyncratic encounter with the divine. So every man has his own faith. And uh, the great gurus are the ones who had such a powerful experience of the divine that they taught others and others wanted to experience that too. But that's another question. <laughs> but the second philosophical tendency of the modernist or foundation is Philip is what uh, he calls um, the problem of phenomenalism. And phenomenalism goes a step farther, and it says, not only can we not know God, who he is, or even his existence, we can't know this by the power of reason. But even the natural world in which we live, we can't even know that. But the human mind cannot even attain the essences and the realities of things around us. And so all we can do is kind of experience the phenomena of things and draw our, kind of our own impressions of these things and our own sense of reality. So um, modernism has at its root the denial of the mind of man being able to know anything of God, but even the disability of not even knowing the world around us for what it really is. It's all just phenomena to us that appear to us to be so, but we can't really know them. Now you take that and you apply that in, in modernism and you can see why the, the modernist comes to this point. The modernist says that it's fine for you, for example, Tom, to have your own faith experience. And you're absolutely convinced of it, but it is yours. It's not mine. So whatever you do, you can't say that this is the true God. 
as though what I'm experiencing that contradicts you is false. You, we, can't, we can't say that anyone actually knows the true God or knows God as he is, okay? But one thing the modernists will tell you is this. Even though your belief is yours, and no one can deny it, that you had this experience and that it's a valid experience, nonetheless, the state can control your expression of your faith. And so the state, because we live in, a, in a, a world of phenomena, when you try to take your faith experience and live it in the world, now you're trying to live your faith in my world, in our world, in the phenomenal world. And as soon as you start translating your faith into some practical behavior, some practical action, some practical worship, now you're bringing it into the area of the phenomena, okay? Like the exterior world outside your head. And that's where the state has the right to control that. And so ultimately for the modernist, the political power of the day is going to have the, the absolute right to, uh, to dictate what you can, not what you can believe or what you can experience, but what you can manifest of your belief or your experience. And so the, the, the civil power is perfectly within its rights to condemn Christianity, to exalt Islam in the interest of the state, and to condemn Christianity. Because after all, the state is, it has to govern the phenomenal world. The world of sight and hearing and the phenomena around us. And in doing so, it has complete control over these phenomena and what you're and they allowed to practice. Liberalism led to exactly the same idea. I mean, the, 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 the liberal idea in Protestantism, cuius regio, eus religio, who is the political power? That is, that's the religion that will dominate in that area. And other religions can be persecuted and driven out. And Father, I know you mentioned before how illogical and even anti-logical this idea is. Uh, here in America, we have this obsession with the idea of the separation of church and state. And you've mentioned before how if you have God as the, the God of the individual, uh, that, that's okay. Maybe even when you get two or three people together, maybe when you get a family together, God is still the God of that family. Maybe even you have a God of a whole parish and that's okay, you have a God of a whole, this whole group of, of believers. But then all of a sudden when you start expanding, you get a city or even a whole country, all of a sudden he's not God anymore. He's not God of the country. We have to totally uh, banish him. We have, we're not allowed to, like you said, have these practical expressions of our faith. And that um, progression is worse than illogical. It's anti-logical mm -hmm. to have this, this progression. Mm -hmm. But Fai, getting back to the text here, and it's a matter, really, Tom, of what an irreligious liberal state is willing to tolerate. It may, but whatever it tolerates, it tolerates as a necessary evil for the moment. Mm -hmm. But it always has the ultimate objective of stamping it out. Sure. Even the communist Chinese do that. Right. They will tolerate these things until they won't. Right? They'll tolerate them as long as they think they have to. Ultimately, liberalism is the same concept, right? Mm -hmm. God has nothing to say about what goes on in this world. Um, the communist Chinese are very good, uh, very good purveyors of, of liberalism, and they, they're great practic practitioners of it, too. Father, in, in keeping with this uh, theme of the parallels between modernism and liberalism, the, uh, the book here also speaks of the, uh, the different degrees of liberalism, and I love, I love this quote here. He says, if men were absolutely logical and followed to their ultimate conclusions, the premises which they lay down, they would become angels or devils in working out the consequences according to the goodness or badness of their first principles. But men are not always logical. They often stop short of the consequences logically following from the premises preceding. He says there are liberals who accept its principles but reject the consequences. Mm -hmm. oh. And the same with modernists. You know? mm -hmm. yeah. And we've seen a number of uh, clergymen even who started along the road of modernism because they were taken in by the high-sounding so-called principles. You know? 
just like when we were taken in by the idea of liberty, equality, and fraternity, you know, in the French Revolution, when they saw the, the grisly and gory consequences, and what those meant who were pushing these slogans, what they really meant, they were horrified by the consequences, and they, they made a hasty retreat. So it is with priests who have accepted the Novus Ordo and, and now retreated from it and reject it, okay? Even, uh, you know, some, some of the leader, uh, leading philosophers of modernism, ultimately, warned against it. And they realized it was uh, very much a false prophecy, a very much false prophets. Next, rather, he talks about this, uh, this idea of Catholic liberal liberalism or liberal Catholicism. He says, liberalism is the dogmatic affirmation of the absolute independence of the individual and of the social region. Catholicity is the dogma of the absolute subjection of the individual and of the social order to the revealed law of God. One doctrine is the exact antithesis of the other. They are opposites in direct conflict. How is it possible to reconcile them? It isn't an irrational being. Yeah. Sure. Again, it all gets down to what I, I guess you could call kind of a spiritual schizophrenia. <laughs> but it goes beyond, you know, spiritual schizophrenia. It, it, it affects the, the mind. It affects the, uh, the the whole existence of the, the person is is a is a massive conflict. Sure. He also talks probably about this uh, idea of like liberalism but not liberalism, and liberalism but not like it. And uh, he, he talks in this chapter about the, uh, the confusion of ideas, and he says that this is a, a scheme as, as old as the devil to try and uh, just distort words and their meanings and mm -hmm. how, important this, how important this is, because words actually mean things, and these are important. And what we're really arguing is not necessarily the, uh, the, the words so much, is really the ideas that these mm -hmm. words represent, and that's why it's so important to uphold the actual mm -hmm. real definitions of these things. I thought that was, uh, that was an important point to make there. But Father, I think we could stop there. We've uh, gotten through roughly half of the book, so I think we could save the rest for a future program, perhaps. But uh, Tom, there's something very interesting that's happened recently, though. Okay. And it's somewhat along these lines, but it's, uh, it, it, it actually is a commentary on everything that you just talked about here. The former head of the Vatican Bank, his name is Casey right now. But he recently published a rather lengthy article exposing the entire program of de-Christianization of the world. And he even talks about it operating in the, in the church, the Nova Serva Church. Uh, it is such a, a, a very, very revealing article that this man is not really telling us what we don't know, but the fact that he is saying it, and that he is who he is. He's laying it right on the, on the, on the, on, on the line here. That what we see happening here in every aspect of life is an offensive of liberalism and all of its consequences to destroy the family for the sake of destroying Christianity, for the sake of destroying Catholicism. And that, that, that this is exactly its purpose, this is its ultimate purpose, and everything it does is, is ordered toward that goal. Um, and he goes down the list and all, this, all these things that have happened. And I think he even ties it together with what happened at the Vatican recently with Francis's uh, great council on uh, climate change. Um, in fact, uh, one woman who is like the head of the United Nations Council on, oh, they, you know, they give it some fancy title with a lot of right. words in it, comes down like this great council on climate change, you know, even says we have to begin to build the ark again, but not a, some kind of spiritual ark, we have to build an ark that will save life on earth, you know. So Francis is actually giving the opportunity. We had to talk about Francis, of course. Um, he's giving this world stage, his own, you know, this, the world stage of this, the, the, even the Paul VI audience hall, over to these, these forces, which this man, the former head of the Vatican Bank, is denouncing as being a, a, a very vast conspiracy. 
a very vast liberal, uh, and everything that goes to liberalism, naturalism, rationalism, all these evil, fake philosophies. Uh, but ultimately, I think we, you know, we can all converge on the idea of the, the liberalist, progressivist idea. That their ultimate objective, make no mistake about it, is to destroy Christianity, to destroy especially, of course, the Catholic Church, and to do what the leader of the Masons said had to be done in the early 1800s, to do what Voltaire said absolutely had to be done about the year 1600, to completely eliminate from the world the very memory of Christ. That's their goal, nothing less than that. They want all memory of Jesus Christ to be completely eradicated from the face of the earth. It's a very interesting article. In fact, I think I'm going to get a hold of it and probably read it here and go on record here because I think it is so well done. Sure. Um, for some people reading it, they might be amazed to hear these ideas expressed. But even those who are not amazed to hear these ideas expressed will be amazed that they're being expressed by somebody who was very, very active and trusted in the Vatican, that he sees it and he's sounding the alarm and telling us this is what's happening, make no mistake about it. <coughs> so in any case, it's all liberalism. It starts, it starts in, the, uh, in the serpent's nest and it develop, develops from there until the entire world is coiled in this in the, in the grip of this constrictor, which is a squeeze, squeezing, trying to squeeze the last drop of faith, hope, and charity out of it. Let's pray for the children, right? We have to turn to Our Lady through all of this. She's the one who has the power to crush the head of the serpent. Father, thanks for being here tonight. Appreciate your time. Take your time. Yep. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics Believe. Until next time, we ask that you all remember the words of Our Lady of Fatima to consecrate yourselves and your families to the Immaculate Heart of Mary and to pray and do penance. Thank you, and God bless you.